you so much for joining us for our latest charity webinar. Today's webinar is on rethinking organizational culture, and I'm delighted to see so many of you online with us this morning. I'm Jill Halford. I head the charities and not-for-profit team here at BDO, and today I'm delighted to be joined by BDO's Head of People Advisory Services, Salt Saletsky. Salt is an organizational culture expert, and I think we'd all agree that while a charity's mission, purpose and strategy can be replicated, your culture is unique and can be a true differentiator. It has far reaching impacts in terms of how your employees and volunteers feel, you perform and you make decisions and, how, and importantly, how resilient your charity is in times of change and uncertainty. Zolt's gonna help us navigate this um, through the next um, hour or so. Um, so before we start, a few points of admin, just to confirm that we will be recording today's session um, and we will circulate the slides and the recording later in the week. Um, so if you would like to share it with colleagues that can't make it today, then please, please do so. Um, also, please have your phones handy. We will be asking some questions um, via the forum Mentimeter. Please don't worry if you haven't used this before, we will talk you through how to do this. Um, but please do have your phones ready to vote and comment at the appropriate time. We will save some time towards the end to ask questions. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Zoom now, but there is at the bottom of the screen, if you hover, a Q&A function. Um, so please pose your questions through that. I'll be monitoring those and we can ask um, Zolt the appropriate questions at the appropriate time. Um, if we don't get through all of the questions within the allotted time, then we will come back to you with a response. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Zolt to start us through the presentation. Thanks, Zolt. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jill. So again, delighted to have you here. And without much further ado, let me just proceed with, with, uh, with the content a little bit. So in terms of culture, now, there are many definitions, and probably you have your own preferred definition. But in order to start in an aligned way, let me just share you what we at BDO use as a definition and what are some of the kind of critical assumptions that we make around the culture proposition. First of all, the simple, almost unscientific way of defining culture is the way we do things and behave around here. So it's 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 you know there are alternatives, but probably for practical business reasons, this is this is good as it is, even though it's a broad definition. So in order to kind of be more specific about that, there are five things that I wanted to highlight as a as a differentiator, as as a strong point in terms of defining culture. First of all, we actually quite strongly believe that culture can only be useful for the organization if it's strongly aligned to organizational strategy and purpose. And particularly in the case of charities and not-for-profit organizations, we have reason to assume that all of these organizations have a noble, respectable, and, and well-defined purpose. And that's why I think culture probably offers a, a, a greater chance for these kind of organizations than general business organizations where, where the purpose is not as naturally a, you know, shared and and not not, not as naturally defined as as in as in not not for profit organizations. Secondly, obviously, culture is 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 a big way organized uh, overlapping with with leadership actions and behavior. So partly it's a leadership credibility, partly it's a leadership development proposition. So you can't actually look at culture without looking at the quality of your leadership and not just leaders as individuals but leaders as a team, how aligned they are, how unifying the messages that they are sharing, how much they align with each other. So that's that's actually a, an important point when we look at the culture. The third point is, well, and this is probably one of the critical points, is that many times culture is defined as very high level, high flying values. And we see the best practice when when culture is pretty much broken down into very specific employee behaviors uh, that can be rewarded or or, or 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 wrong behaviors that could should be not tolerated or actually defining the level of tolerance what is what is acceptable in the organization but the key point is that culture cannot be just high flying set of values culture is not equal to values that needs to be more specific more observable behaviors and norms. Then 
the, the, the fourth point is, yes, you have a culture, hopefully defined, but it is, it is sustained, it's only sustainable if you have symbols, stories, and, 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 and communication around that. And particularly like when, I, when I think about symbols, probably the best example is that one of the most known organizations globally wanted to keep their, for instance, customer focus by assigning an empty chair on all meetings that they say, look, this imagine this is the, the seat for your client. And whenever you run a meeting, then, then just it's a friendly reminder that you are here to serve your clients. And I thought that's a fantastic symbolic way of, of expressing what, what is important for them. Then stories. Again, uh, another client I used to work with, they, they had all sorts of stories about endurance and heroism. And that was their culture about, you know, how they soldier on and how they survive some difficult situations while delivering their value. So all in all, that's an important element too, that you need to have that kind of, that kind of uh, stories around, which is, which is a very useful narrative. And last but not least, obviously, culture in, is impacted by not just your environment, which keeps the, organized, uh, keeps the culture in a dynamic form, but also systems and processes, and particularly your reward system, your promotion, your performance management, that should actually send out or reinforcing messages to your culture. And that's probably uh, a best practice also to, to, to look at whether these systems are aligned with your, with your defined culture. So that's pretty much our definition. That's the foundation. When it comes to why organizations deal with culture, we can differentiate about three main motives why they do this. And probably let me just do that in a slightly, slightly odd way from right to left, because actually I think most organizations start with meeting external regulator or stakeholder expectations. This is a, almost an external compliance drive. You, you can read some of, the, some of the bullet points here more specifically, but the main point is that it, it's an external pressure. And that's why, that's why they, they, they have no particular choice about that. They need to deal with culture. The middle point is, is uh, or, or the middle column is about more about internal standards, internal standards, particularly about ethics and compliance. It's not externally driven, but it's still compliance driven. It's still about you have your standards, you have your expectations, and you'd like to deliver on that uh, with, with a great amount of consistency. But I just wanted to mention that even though most of the cases, the start of the culture is anchored in either external or internal compliance, in fact, what we found that, that uh, culture is a very significant contributor to long-term and sustainable competitive, competitive or you know, kind of organizational advantage. So in, in terms of commercial organizations, you actually see more like competitive, competitive advantage. But in, in, in case of, of uh, not-for-profit organizations, I, I, would, I would actually underline resilience. How you can how you can fast and agile way react changes in your external environment or an internal environment. So generally speaking, it drives uh, organizational performance, no matter whether it's commercial performance or 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 something else. So you see some of the typical motives. And at this point, let me see whether we can actually use our Mentimeter. So Mentimeter is a is a tool. Probably you are familiar with that. If not, this is a very simple thing to use. And we wanted to use it a couple of times during the presentation to sample your views. So if you can simply go to menti.com and it should prompt you to our code. And this is the code you need to use. And, and they are very simple questions about if you think about driving your culture or improving your culture, what is your main motive out of the three things I can see someone started to, oh yeah, that's great. It's coming through. So let us give ourselves something like 30 seconds to do this exercise to see what drives you. And basically you can have multiple choices. If there are more motives that you see present in your case, please click on all of them. That's interesting to see how it shapes up. Give it a couple of more seconds. 
Yeah, it's still changing. All right. Well, you can still vote on that and you'll get the results later on. But the way I read this is somewhat surprisingly, you already, I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to the converts because you see well, from, from this, from this uh, statistics that uh, performance and resilience seems to be the prime motive, which is, which is great to see. Actually, that's the end and well, that's the ultimate goal of, of, of any cultural, pro it is a business proposition. It is an organizational effectiveness proposition. It's not for goodwill. It's not for for you know public relations. This is hardcore, and and I often face the question, particularly from from CEO CFOs. Okay, but what's your return on investment? How you can quantify that? That's a tricky question. You know, cutting the long story short, culture to me is like a multiplicator. If you have any other projects and and any other initiatives. If you do culture right, this multiplies all of the other initiatives. So it's almost like an enabler, helping you with your cost cutting, with your international expansion, with your donor management, with your employee engagement, etc. So in itself, culture is might not well, it, it's very difficult to see the, the, the return on investment, but actually it is it is like a multiplicator. Also, I see quite a good number on internal standards and ethics. And not that surprisingly, little less on regulatory expectations because because of the nature of the of the sector. If I were to ask this question in financial sector or pharma or you know some of the more heavily regulated se uh, sectors like oil and gas, probably that would have been different. At some point, I would be interesting to learn about something else. You know, four people saying this is driven by something else. So if you'd like to use the common. Uh, uh, common uh, functionality of the of, of zoom that would be fantastic or we, we can get to that when, when we when we get to the uh, Q&A session all right with that let me move on and just give you a little bit of almost like a, a sector sector outlook zooming out a little bit because not for profit I'm going to cover some of the culture specificities in the next slide but I just wanted to give you a bit of a broader outlook because probably it's it's a wise idea to look broader and see what can you learn from other factors. So I, I, I don't want to read all that stuff out. I just wanted to give you a bit of a highlight about what are the concerns or questions or challenges that some of the other fact, uh, sectors are facing. You might want to say, hey, that's interesting. At hospitality, I can see something that concerns me. For my two pennies, actually the three or four sectors where I would look for good benchmarks or good stories, comparable challenges, would be obviously public sector, where particularly, you know, resistance to change, some of the political influence, some of the limited resources uh, sets the scene. I, I think public sector practices might be interesting. Technology and media, well, these days everyone is becoming a technology company, whether you like it or not. So understanding how you how you adjust to fast-paced technology changes, how you can use technology to enhance your business. So technology and media is a safe choice to look for state-of-the-art uh, solutions when it comes even to culture. And then maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I think professional services can offer a couple of good lessons for not-for-profit organizations, particularly when it comes to attracting the kind of individuals that you need, uh, keeping them engaged, uh, like your volunteer popula uh, population. But again, it is your choice. It is more like a restaurant menu. You don't have to sample it all, but it's good to be aware what are the other sectors challenges and where you might want to look for benchmarks or, or best practices. Now, more importantly, let's take a little closer look at what we think differentiates your sector, not-for-profit sector, what are the specificities that, that we managed to identify when, when we worked with, with organizations in the sector? Well, first of all, one of the differentiating cultural factor is the passionate individuals. You, you seem to attract people with great amount of in, internal drive, passion about something, that's why they join particularly volunteers, but also I would say your permanent staff would be probably more passionate individuals. They have more, 
uh, I would say sensitivity to, to, to values and, and purpose. So that I think is, is, is clearly a differentiating factor in, 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 in the sector. Second thing is collaborative work environment. So in fact, by definition, the value of teamwork, the open communication seems to be a, a golden standard for, for, for your organizations and that has cultural implications. Resource constraints, I don't think I need to explain that too much. You need, well, and once you have uh, actually constraints in your resources, you need to think very carefully where you put them. And that's true, particularly when it comes to people resources. When we think about cultural changes, there are many ways you can improve that. I think in a not-for-profit sector, I would strongly argue that take a good focus. You don't have the resources, neither financially nor people-wise, uh, to, to try to do all the things which are useful. So finding out what are the one, two, maybe three particular hotspots or key areas, which makes the most different, uh, difference and in a positive sense, I think it's a good advice. It's generally good advice to keep your focus, but I think it's particularly a good advice for not-for-profit organizations. Well, again, uh, we see some sort of a cyclical nature of, of the business when it comes to volunteerism. And, and, and then, then I think for that, what I would say the consequence is that uh, probably you need to adopt your culture as you go on. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's less standard or predictable. So you need to be more flexible on, on managing your culture. And last but not least, ethical practices. I, I don't think I need to explain why this is important. You know, organizations living on their goodwill and on their reputation, they need to be double careful. And we have some cases where where, you, where, where organizations burn their finger and actually undermine their own existence by not paying attention to ethical concerns. So these are the five things that might resonate with you. I would be very keen to get your comments about, uh, about those, whether any of these uh, is, is standing out or whether or we missed some point. By the way, I just wanted to mention that we are open to, 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 to be asked or to be interrupted by questions as we go. However, what I would suggest, not try to keep the questions that more like point of information, kind of clarification questions during the presentation. I'm happy to take that. But if you have more conceptual comments or questions, let's say that we have 10, 15 minutes at the back end to handle that. And also, I just wanted to leave this slide with mentioning that if you'd like to do a little deeper reading about what culture means for non-for-profit non organizations, we identified a couple of good readings for you, which might give you a bit of a deeper, deeper perspective on, on, on the matter. With that, let me move on <clears throat> and introduce you what we think is, is, is a very specific BDO way of, of uh, approaching the culture. What we, um, how we define and why we, why we say unifying culture. Unifying culture, and I have had a preliminary question from the audience about that. You know, how, how do we manage when we have multiple organizations with multiple cultures, et cetera? And basically unifying culture is not uniform culture. That's the first point I wanted to make. Unifying culture might be the few things that you think truly unites your organization, whether it's a very, you know, you know very dispersed organization internationally or by activity, or whether it is more focused organization, you need to find out what are the few points that really uh, unifies your organization. And don't be shy if it's just one or two. In fact, the, the fewer unifying cultural elements you find, the better it is because the easier it is to, to, to manage that. Again, back to my point about, about being focused. So. In terms of, again, it's almost again like a restaurant menu. We have done some research, quite a bit of research about looking at available culture models globally. And what we have found that there are about 14 elements that comes up almost regularly in all culture models in one way or another. There are different vocabulary used, et cetera. And we have our definitions for that. I don't bore you with the definitions, but what I wanted to make a clear point on that there are two kinds of uh, Cultural, cultural factors that we need to look at. 
on your right hand side, you see what we see fundamental elements like fairness, respect, trust, and integrity, where a, most organizations include that somehow in, in their culture aspirations. And, and the difference between fundamental and choice elements is that fundamental elements, you need to be, or you try to be as good as you can be. There is no reason why not try to be 100% uh, good on fairness, on respect or trust, et cetera. So pretty much it's, it's, it's just one way direction. And again, you, you are as good as you can be. Well, all on that, all on all of the seven factors on your right. Well, obviously, you yes, all of them gives value. But back to my point about the the focus. What is the one or two that you really want it to be world class? What is your differentiating fundamental elements? Whereas respecting that, you want it to be good on the others. Now, the left hand side contains different culture factors which we describe as distinctive choices, where you need to make very conscious choice about where you want to be innovation-wise. Give you an example, for instance, if you are in a pharma business or in technology business, you wanted to max out your innovation. But if you are in a, let's say, aviation business or, or nuclear power station business, you may not want to be excessively innovative. You want it to respect the value of good and, and tested methods and, 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 and you don't take too much risk. Same thing about agility, how fast, how much ahead of the curve you need to be, or you just wanted to be an early follower, or you wanted to be a late follower. Same thing about risk appetite, autonomy, etc. Perhaps the one thing I wanted to single out is the last one, tolerance, which is a little bit of a strange thing. Tolerance is about, the, you know, once you define what good culture looks like, and, and translate it to behaviors and norms, tolerance describes the way or how much tolerant you are with that. So what, A, how much, how much tolerance you are with non-compliant behaviors and what you do with non-compliant behaviors. So, you know, the, the far, far side of the tolerance scale is that you have zero tolerance. You say, look, whenever you see something which is not right, you just take decisive action, whatever it is, either disciplinary or, or education, et cetera, but you always act on that. The, the lower end of the tolerance scale would be that, that you, it's more recommendation, kind of, this is what we'd like to be, but if we are not displaying that behavior all the times, that's, that's okay. There are no harsh consequences or any consequences. It's more like a recommendation. So it's hard for expectation or, or more like a directional advice on, on tolerance. But again, I just wanted to make sure that you, you have the differentiation between fundamental elements where, where, where you need to be good at and distinctive choices where there is no one size fits all. You need to find out where you want it to be. Just using BDO as an example, uh, we, we managed to boil down to four particular uh, uh, cultural elements. Three of them would be fundamental. One of them would be distinctive choice where we'd like to be very word class. It doesn't mean that we don't care about the rest of it. It means that we have clear laser focus on the things that uni unites us rather than differentiates us. Okay, well, I, I, hope, I hope you get the gist of it because now we are going to test it with Mentimeter, if you'd like. Uh, before we do that, I just wanted to mention one, one more thing is what is it, how you can measure these things? Because this looks to be all right. I mean, hopefully you see the relevance of all these 14 factors. How can you measure that? How can you understand where you are or where you want it to be? There are five ways uh, we can recommend. One is leadership interviews, particularly when it comes to, you know, alignment of your leadership, understanding where the focuses are, leadership interviews could be very useful and essential to see. Culture survey is the typical tool, understanding what people use about that, but also there are external data, particularly Glassdoor is a very useful source of information. And I will show you other publicly available benchmarks about culture data. Uh, data and document review, particularly when it comes to, you know, some of the systems and processes, what is valued at the organization, performance management, how promotions are being made, uh, you know, just reviewing your communications, reviewing your 
if you have any culture, culture related manifesto, your strategy. Okay? So that sort of thing uh, that, you, that you might wanna do. Focus group is a particularly good, useful tool when you're looking at what is what are the norms, what are the behaviors that are associated with certain cultural values. So focus groups probably to me would be one of the, or if not the most effective tool to understand an organizational culture. And then obviously you can do more specific strategy workshops and reviews, which is, which is pretty much about looking ahead. It's not, not that much about defining culture as it is, but more like defining your aspirations for the future. So these are the tools, basically, there are some other tools, but these are the tools that help us to calibrate the culture, understand where it is, and, and defining where we'd like to see that going. So that with that, let me just show you what would be the result of, of any such an exercise. For instance, looking at, again, the right-hand side, you see how far we are on the curve in terms of the seven fundamental elements where we are on, 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 on this race. And also, but when it comes to the distinctive choices, you need to have two outcomes, where we are, the current position, and where we'd like to be. But it's not essential that you'd like to be, again, very innovative or very risk-driven. So it is more about the size of the gap that matters rather than where it is. All right, now, with that, I already warned you that there would be an exercise about this. So let me just see if you can, again, use your Mentimeter. Please use, use this code up on the screen, top of the screen. And first, I'm asking you about your as is situation about your fundamental elements, where you see yourselves in terms of the seven fundamental values we have. I wonder if you can find your device, go to menti.com. And it's a very quick, I appreciate it is, it is a subjective and it's a very, you know, biased uh, assessment, but that's as good as we can do today. And I'll stop talking, give you a minute to do the exercise. Great, thank you so much. Let's give it half a minute more. That's interesting to see how dynamically it's changing. I trust you can see my screen so you can see yourself how the horse race is going. Well, let me stop. Again, we are not freezing that, but let me stop you know, giving my first reactions to that. First of all, I'm very happy to see the support and well-being being one of the strongest elements. That's, that's great. Perhaps the other thing, which, which is, is somehow notable to me, is the collaboration and accountability, because I actually think this is one of the critical cultural element for not-for-profit organizations, collaboration particularly, accountability too, but collaboration. And, and if, you, if you score yourself intuitively a little lower than average on this, this translates to me like a good way to start thinking about how you can visualize collaboration, understand uh, collaboration, make it actually a, a, a cultural element that, that, that you might want to leverage. All the others are reasonably in the same base camp, Probably, well, the, the other strong point about the purpose, which, which is something I expected, and, and it's great to see. Respect and recognition, also good to see there as a high level, but, but perhaps the one thing that I take away from that is the collaboration, which is, which is lower than I expected, and I see that as an opportunity rather than anything else. All right, then. Uh, with that, let me move on to the second part, which is more like uh, the uh, more like the the uh, electable or 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 choices that you can make, and here what I'm asking you to try to define the two the, the gaps. So if if we had a longer session, probably I would have asked you where you are and where you'd like to be. 
Now, on the time constraint, I'm asking you to combine that two and just give us where you think the biggest gaps are in your organization in terms of the distinctive choices. Again, I give you a minute to do that exercise. Well, answer is still coming in. Give it 10, 15 seconds more. But what seems to be the trend is that long-term thinking seems to be one of the uh, you know, elements where you see the biggest gap. So thinking less opera operationally and a little more strategically, that seems to be sticking out to me. Perhaps the other big gap in, in agility and I think agility is important because as I, as I, as I said, I see not-for-profit organizations for a need for being very agile and adaptable uh, you know, in, in, in changing conditions, in, in trying to understand balance between different stakeholders or among different stakeholders' priorities and in a very changeable uh, environment. I think agility is an important one and I can see the big gap there. Uh, but long-term thinking seems to be clearly the one which is which which you see the biggest gap. All the others are reasonably in the in the same camp. But again, it's but first of all, it might give you a little bit of reflection how other similar organizations think. But I also wanted to play a little bit with these uh, fourteen components. I, you know, once you start to work with that, probably you have a bit more comfort. But if you'd like to dig deeper into the definitions and the benchmarks. We are very happy to help you with that later on. Uh, let me move on. And there was one particular uh, question about back to office. But before I do so, let me stop here. Jill, do you have some questions or comments? Uh, just one one quick question we've had from, from the audience, Alt, was just to help um, the audience understand the statistics coming through from Mentimeter. Um, they just wanted to roughly know how many people were voting. Um, so roughly, I've been keep, keeping a track, it's between 30 and 35. Um, votes that we're getting through for every poll, just to yeah. give that, Thank that you insight. So Thanks cool. a lot. Well, because some people on the call might not be comfortable or not be in a position using using this technology, but at least, I mean, 30 is not huge, not statistically relevant, but given, given the sector focus we have, I think it's still an interesting insight. But again, the point of the exercise, not to have reliable benchmarks, the point of the exercise is to start a little bit getting your hands dirty with, with the concept and the, and, the, and the factors we are using here. Another way of, of using this tool, I just wanted to mention that because there has been a question about you know, hybrid, hybrid work, return to office, and that's, by the way, RTO, sorry for this abbreviation, return to office. You know, I, I'm pretty sure you all sort of struggle or deal with this question of how to enhance return to office. And there has been some research by us which says it, you know, there are four things when you are when you're looking at return to office, what might be unifying part of that, there are four activities that you might want to see people doing when in office. So instead of asking people to come back just for being back and being more efficient or whatever. You say, what are the activities that you can do in your office better than remotely? And there are four things that we, we have identified. Obviously, socialization, sort of just hanging out with colleagues, having small chats, corridor talks, collaboration, which I think is, is relevant in the context of the previous Menti, education, not formal education, but learning by doing, coaching, doing things together, understanding how others approach different uh, tasks and issues. And inspiration, just sharing the inspiration, sharing the spark in the eyes, seeing people enthusiastic, getting your inspiration. If you have these four elements, inspiration, socialization, collaboration, and education, I just want to demonstrate you how it translates to some of the values. Depending on what is your main motive, there are actually the five elements here that might actually play a role in different parts of that. So for instance, if you are if you are looking at 
socialization. It is, it is clearly seen that it's collaboration and accountability to some extent that, that, that would be a, an, an important part. Or, collabor uh, or if you're looking at inspiration, that is clearly the purpose element. Education, competence, and development. So you can find actually how the different parts can be matched or aligned with cultural, fundamental cultural values. But if you're looking at what are the distinctive choices, that are affected by the return to office challenge, probably it's innovation, one of them. If, you, if you'd like to be more innovative, uh, if, you, if one of the outcomes that you're looking for uh, in terms of return to office is innovation, then, then that's one of the things that you should focus your efforts or work autonomy, how you define autonomy, how you can, how you can balance between you know, home, home working autonomy and, and back to office collaboration. So these are, it's just a kind of quick and dirty illustration about how you can, how you can use the model tackling specific problems, specific challenges that you, that you might have. And again, if, if your challenge is, is more about international expansion or, or reorganization, you can do the same exercise. You can pretty much use your business or organizational motives and translate it to cultural values, see how the culture can actually support your transformation, whatever that transformation is. All right, uh, I'm just going too fast. So, well, one of the typical questions we are, we are facing is that, all right, but how you can measure that? What are the good metrics? And I can, I can give you the top 10 culture-related metrics, and I'm not going to read that out. It might be actually just Ask yourself, do, do you actually measure F, uh, any of this already? Because if you do, why reinventing the wheel? If not, you might actually pick one or two ideas that you might say, oh, that's interesting. Well, I would say the more metrics you use, the more complex the picture, but the more reliable that is. So, so my humble suggestion would be maybe start with one or two lead metrics. And as you get your your, your foot in, into that practice, you might want to add gradually more and more. All, all, all of a sudden, it, it gets more messy. It gets more complicated, but, but, the, but it's also richer. So it's a bit of a balance. But these are actually the, the 10 key metrics that organizations tend to use when they, when they start to measure culture. What also we often get, how you can get benchmarks. And there are two kinds of benchmarks. Either they are anecdotal, almost like storytelling benchmark, which we covered in, in, in the previous section when we talked about best practices, but they are also metric benchmarks. And let me tell you, let me show you what is the best publicly available benchmarks that we use and we also think you can use. This is actually a study by Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT for sure. And they have done a, quite an extensive study. The bad news is that they are, they, they included large organizations, not small ones, but they covered out of the, out of the 14 uh, factors that we have, they cover nine and they cover a, a bunch of industries or, or sectors. And I, I just wanted to quickly switch, show you the, the, their site, Culture Top 500. That's their site. And this is, pretty much the values, cultural values that they cover. And what you can do, and now let me just jump back to my presentation. So there are two things you can do. You can either click on certain values and look at what are the global best practices for, for, for that particular value, or you can look at industries. In, in that particular thing, I, I clicked on research hospitals, you know, being not comparable exactly, but you know, at least they are not you know, large technology firms or you know, financial institutions, etc. So you can look at how they, how certain industries, certain specific players, show about integrity, respect, or whatever else you'd like to do. Well, bad news is that they are not covering all fourteen values, just nine of them. But nine of them are, are much better than zero. And secondly, the the data you see here is based heavily on Glassdoor. So Glassdoor kind of employee or ex-employee feedback on some of their culture. And there's a robust methodology. If you'd like to read about that, again, I switch back here. There is a bit of a methodology description here uh, that, you can, that you can use later on. And, and, and so basically it's a quite a 
quite a, an extensive uh, study and uh, and and probably the best I can offer in terms of in terms of specific measurable and 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 data driven data driven exercise. So there are others. We are very happy to to, to discuss that with you later on. But that's pretty much uh, the the sort of golden standard, if you'd like, in terms of the in terms of the immediate metrics and some of the best practices. Now, change management wise, I think there is one notable change that I wanted to draw your attention. Change management is usually in a kind of old traditional way defined like a programmatic approach saying that you have a you have a stable situation which you seek to unfreeze, then you make a movement from a, a position to something which is perceived to be better and you rephrase it. So you have an order in a better form. So you start from an order kind of chaos and then reorder. That looked to be the case for the last 30 years. That's probably the most used programmatic approach. What is emerging now, which is more of an organic or it's called emergent uh, change, it is, it is anchored in technology, but now I can see that kind of edging out. And basically it says, let's, let's accept the fact that our existence is somehow chaotic. And in, instead of trying to control this whole thing and particularly the, the, the chaos in terms of culture, why don't you try to create just local order, focus on certain things you can change and then let it go back to a better chaos. So it's from chaos to chaos, through a little bit of an order. And it is, you know, the analogy I used to use, if you have a bowl of spaghetti in front of you, you can choose to try to order it in a nice controllable way, or you can just take your fork, take a, 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 a forkful uh, a bite of, of, of the thing, swirl it up, twist it up, and then you take it. This is pretty much about the culture. You don't try to control the whole thing. You don't try to engineer your culture. You, if you take a bit more humble approach and say, look, I don't control it all, but at least I control the bits or one bit that is important. That's why if you remember one message about the culture, all the model is good for helping you to identify what is the one or two critical culture focus that you need to take. Try to focus your scarce resources on that. And then what you might find is that if you make the dial move on one or two critical elements, this is likely to have a halo effect. So in fact, it will bring other unwanted or unexpected benefits if you really make progress on one or two. So that's pretty much, uh, now that's probably the last but one slide that, that I want to share with you, what you can do. What is it, if you wanted to switch from a thinking mode into an action mode, there are four typical solutions that you can do, or there are some obviously many, customized way. One is understanding, A, you can, you can engage yourself into understanding what, what your culture is today. That's one, one good solution or good way to, to, to get going about it. Second is you can add maturity assessment. So understanding how you are with an external benchmark, how you are scoring against practice industry standards or, or sector standards. So the difference between understanding this, this this is pretty much yourself, uh, understanding your own culture as it is. It is the, the maturity assessment is understanding your culture with a, with a benchmark element. Then you can engage into defining your strategy. Again, back to my focus point, where are the few points that you really like to concentrate? Or actually you can start focusing on the change and transformation, how to make it happen. Now with that, let me just challenge you with the last but one mentee. One is that if you need to choose among these four things, where would you where would you put your efforts thinking about your organization? Again, an antimeter challenge, and we have one more coming down. And you can see the numbers here, at least coming back to the question, how many people are actually voting here? Well, it seems to be a clear winner so far, which is defining the direction of strategy, not much understanding where you are, but 
finding your focus. And I'm very happy to see that because that is probably one of the key messages from the session. Don't waste your resources trying to do all the things in a way, but do few things, but do them very concentrated and well. And I think that's coming through on, on, on this chart. Well, I'm conscious of time, so let me move to the last question, which would be, well, of course, you can still finish that, but we don't want to impose our four alternatives in terms of culture action. We would really like to close this session by asking you gently to say, what is it that you now would like to engage or do uh, as a result of this session? So with your own words, uh, not forcing you into these four selective choices. So basically, it's just a word cloud kind of thing. And we are asking you, jot down one or two thoughts that you might want to do uh, in your organization. Well, it might be the same as, as we had before, but we, we wanted to make sure this is a kind of free text choice. And we'd like to understand more specifically what you are keen to do on, on culture, if anything at all. Yeah, I think I need to somehow make it visible. That's the results coming a little strange. Well, if it's not going to display it now, what I can commit that we are going to send back these results to you. Uh, I, I would have expected actually the answers coming, coming through in a legible form, but I think it's more important. We, aren't, we wanted to ask you to do it for yourself. It's not for us. It's pretty much for yourself. Making sure that you take away something from this session, which is actionable, which, which helps you to take your, take your direction. And also I can see we are about time. So let, let me switch back now to a kind of conclusion question session. So, so Jill, if there are any more questions, please help me dealing with that or, or I have you. a couple of questions which, which, which already yeah. submitted. Before. Yes, so we've got, a, we've got a couple coming in, which are um, similar to what you've touched on throughout the session, but I think just puts a slightly different angle on it. Um, so one of the participants have asked, how do you engage senior leaders who yeah. think that culture is someone else's issue to sort out? Interesting question. Yeah, well, I would say uh, data helps on that quite a bit, because once you have some unquestionable data, if, if, if I were you in that situation, probably what I would do, I would do some kind of a fact-based fact culture assessment, uh, maybe well, using external benchmarks and, and internal data and come up with something which is very compelling, which cannot be, cannot be swept away. Well, if it's, if it's a question about the ownership, uh, you know, that, is, that, is, that takes education, probably. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and there are some very good manifesto from you know, very, I would say, business-minded people who had their conversion from a complete denier to, a, to actually an enthusiastic supporter. And if you can see, for instance, people like, like Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, who is a for, actually for-profit guy, a technology guy, and how he describes his conversion from a, not a denier, but he's probably one of the greatest champion in business community about the importance of culture. And, and there are many other examples which might actually serve as an inspiration for your leadership team saying that, look, this is a hardcore organizational leadership matter. It's not for HR, it's not for someone else. This is the way you drive your business. So education one way or another. Super, thank you. And how would you adjust the approach to culture in an entirely remote working environment? Then, I would say nothing different. You know, you need to understand what is important in, in that case. And there are probably some usual suspect in an entire remote, like collaboration. How would you do collaboration? Inspiration-wise, how you get your inspiration. So I think I had that slide back up later on. What are the important things which I don't think uh, complete remote organizations uh, can do? Yes. So... Yeah, but any, anyway, it, it is not 
it is not different from a methodology point of view. It is just different elements of the culture model where you would focus if you have a completely uh, remote workforce. I, I totally agree. And that was a really fascinating slide um, that you put up because as you know, Zolt, that's something that we've been we've been grappling with with hybrid working as well and that education um, of the just on the job learning has yeah. been a real, you know, it's been a real deficit as we've been working remotely, which has been been a challenge for us all. And, and perhaps just one thought on that. It's not pushing people to come back to office. It's like pulling them. If you yes. actually sell them, what are the things they can benefit from if they are back in office? And I don't mean free lunch. I mean collaboration, <laughs> inspiration, socialization. And so if you yes. manage to sell that proposition, that is probably a much better full approach than, than trying to push them to come back. Super. And another question we have in, how can um, good organizational culture be shouted about to help improve employee retention and recruitment? Well, I would say that's a very, very, uh, very strong point because if you have a stronger, a, be a better defined culture in itself, it helps you to attract the right kind of people because the, the more clear what you stand for, what, what you offer, I think it's it's a better deal for everyone because people know what they come from and they don't have bigger disappointment. We, mm. let, let me give you just another example how you can do it wrong. Many organizations feel compelled to say, look, we need to have teamwork in our statement, even if they are not working in teamwork or we are family oriented, even though they are asking people work, working long hours. So I think it's much better not to overpromise and underdeliver. Make sure there are few things that you can really deliver on and that helps you not just attracting people, but retaining them. Because too often I see when you, when you think we need to offer that in order to stay competitive, you offer a lot of things which you don't really mean. And, and then obviously people after a few months or even a few weeks, they realize this is, this is not what I'm getting. And then mm. you're not doing yourself a favor because that you import tensions, you actually engineer your higher, uh, higher uh, attrition rates. So make sure that, that you only focus on those cultural things where you are confident you can deliver and not just, not just lip service, but you know, behaviors, leadership support, some of the systems supporting that. Again, all the things that I talked about, and probably there are not many of them. I mean, if, there, if there's an organization who can excel in one or two cultural mm -hmm. dimensions, head off. If you can do three, that's fantastic, work class. So you don't need to excel all the 14. No, I, I totally agree. And, and I do a lot of um, recruitment, as you know, for, for BDO. And one of the key things that, you know, we discuss as we're going through that interview process is our culture report. Um, and that for us is quite an extensive document. If, you know, the audience members haven't seen it, it's, it's worth, a, worth a quick flick through. Just to, it's one of our mechanisms to be able to articulate our culture. And obviously there's a huge amount of effort that goes into producing something like that. So, you know, you have to kind of, work out actually whether that would be a benefit for your charity but um something similar i think and being so public about it but of course you have to you have to deliver on that um you know and it was one of the things as i joined video as an organization that i i read and tested and challenged and and yeah pleased to say that it it is actually you know in operation and um does really clearly reflect our our culture yeah um, i mean the good old advice less is more in a yes. sense that that again don't be shy focusing on one or two things. In fact, I, I, I would strongly advise you to take your focus very clearly, communicate about that, measure that. And, and, and then mm. when you are confident, you can add another one, but start small, walk before you run. Super. Um, another question that we have in, um, how do you get operational teams and the back office support teams in a national organization to work better together? That one, one thing is that there are several ways to skin a cat. So, so once you have uh, agreed cultural directions, you need to acknowledge mm. the fact that there are different ways to organize that, uh, to contribute to that. So there's no one size fits all. That's why I say not uniform culture, unifying culture. For instance, if you think innovation, a finance team can contribute quite differently than a, uh, than a, than a field customer care team or a product development team or whatever. Mm -hmm. So first of all, acknowledging the fact that there are different behaviors uh, that can support a similar outcome. So a a acknowledge that and allow some flexibility. So, so basically the point is that, that you agree on the direction, 
but you give flexibility the way the contribution is right. The analogy I can use, culture used to be thought of as a mothership going into one direction. But nowadays we look at more like a fleet. You have different independent units or not independent, dependent units in a, in a sense, mm. sailing in a fleet, but they are operated differently. And the main thing is that you agree on direction and the speed. And then some, again, again the mechanics of, 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 of leading to that uh, should be different and, and, and should be allowed to be different. Super, thank you. And I'm going to take one, one final question, Zol. Um, how much of leadership behaviours impact culture? Leadership may say they care about culture, but their behaviours may not be consistent with the culture that they want the organisation to embody. Very much so. I would say that's, that's not just an uphill battle, but an impossible battle to, to, to de develop your culture if your leadership is not 100% behind that. So, so probably that's one of the focuses in that case you should take. Make sure you educate your, your leadership team. In fact, there are advanced methodologies to see how aligned your leadership is, particularly on culture. And I had a, a client, for instance, where we just asked them to mm. do one minute video clips about their manifesto on culture. And we did that independently. And we collated this whole thing, edited them, played it back. And they were shocked to see, they thought they are one organization speaking with one voice. And when they heard and seen each other talking about the culture, with a, a very divergent way, they said, hey, wait a second, we need to address that. So some kind of aha moment like that would be useful to raise the awareness of, of your leadership team that unless you really devote time, attention, and, and some sort of internal alignment discussion about that, you are unlikely to make any progress. So cutting the long story short, without a visible and clear leadership support, I don't think culture goes anywhere. Or it, it can go yeah. somewhere just not mm. controlled yes well there's a there's an action for me for my my not-for-profit leadership team um thought huge thanks absolutely brilliant i've i've personally learned a, a huge amount um thank you so much for all of our um audience for for attending today we've had a few questions so just to uh, reconfirm we will be sending the recording and the slides around to everyone and um, we'll also include the comments that unfortunately we couldn't pop up towards the end um, so you can see those two and obviously the results of the Menti poll as well. And we've had um, one query come through to um, request a link to the culture report. Um, so we will send that to as well. Um, we'll also um, send you a feedback form. We'd be really grateful if you could spend a few minutes um, just providing some feedback, as you know, that helps us improve. Um, but thank you so much. Thanks to Hannah for organising us behind the scenes and huge thanks for, Zolt, for all of the uh, preparation and insightful presentation today. Um, we do have quite a few uh, webinars coming up, so please do watch the mailing list and the website as well. Um, we have a series over the next three months of charity webinars, which we are um, entitling Every Penny Counts. So the first one is all, all around maximising income, the second on reducing cost, and the third on cash flow. So they'll be happening over the next three months. And I know a number of you that are on the, on the call will also be attending the Charity Finance Group Conference at the end of June. Um, we have a stand there. Please do come along and see us. Um, we also have one of our um, other colleagues, David Ellis, who is presenting at the CFG conference, uh, creating a compelling employee value proposition. So I think it, it really fits very well with Salt's uh, presentation there. So huge thanks to everyone um, and have a lovely rest of the day.